Thank you so much uh, for joining us here today as part of the Southeast Engineering Festival. My name is Kaylee and I work for CalMAST, which is the Science, Technology, Engineering and Maths Engagement Centre based in Waterford Institute of Technology. The reason we're all here today is, of course, because it is Engineers Week and the Southeast Engineering Festival is a joint initiative between the IT Carlo and Waterford Institute of Technology, who are joining together very, very shortly in May to become Southeast Technological University. So we're nearing the end of Engineers Week, but we're not quite there yet. Um, if anyone would like to check out our other events, which are running tomorrow, we have an engineering quiz for TUI students, and we also have the finale of our Sustainable Engineering Challenge. Be sure to visit our website. Of course, the reason we're here today is because this is an engineering as a career event with a mixed panel. Yesterday, you might have heard our female careers panel, which had a huge array of really inspiring and real life stories. And it's great to hear the ups and downs, the lumps and bumps that everyone experiences on their journey to become an engineer. Without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to our chair of today's session, Dr. Neve Shaw, who is uh, herself an engineer and has her own inspiring story to tell. So Neve, without further ado, thank you so much and take it away. Thanks, Kaylee, and, um, and happy Engineers Week, everybody. It's great. I love doing these. I've been working with CalMAS now for a few years in these uh, career events, and I just love the idea, the format that you're just going to get a chance to hear from a, from a person who's an engineer, and you're going to hear uh, firsthand what their career has been like so far. Just like Kaylee said, yeah, I'm an engineer. Um, I studied engineering in UCD. Um, I did what's known as biosystems engineering, which is a type of engineering that kind of mixes mechanical engineering with, with agriculture. And then I went on, I did a master's in that, and then I did a PhD in science. And then I became an actor and a writer. And then I became a, a communicator and um, I'm obsessed with space. And I also love uh, reporting and promoting science and engineering whenever I can. So this is one of the many things that I do. If I had known that at 17, um, I didn't know it at 17. At 17, I just was filling out a CAO form. So you never know where your career is, is going to go, I think. And there are many, many, many paths. And I guess along the way, you just build up skills. So that's me. But let's hear from, from far more interesting people than, than me. Um, we, we are joined by um, three people. We may have more. We're having a few technical issues with, with some of the other speakers who may join us. But if not, it's fine because we have more than enough um, with, with the three people with us today. So I'm just going to go through in, in the order of my screen here. So we have Radu uh, joining us and he studied um, civil engineering in IT Carlo and now works at ESB International. So let's just quickly say hello to him and we'll go back to him and find out a little bit more. So how are you, Radu? and where are you speaking to us from today? So hi everyone, um, I'm very glad to be with you guys. Um, I'm actually speaking to you from Transylvania, okay, that's actually a, an actual place. Wow. <laughs> uh, it's over in Romania, so yeah, uh, Lovely. it's looking nice and bright over here. Lovely, great, we're looking forward to uh, hearing from you, we'll come back to you shortly and we'll get, we'll get a roundup of your career story so far, so thanks thanks very much Radu. Uh, next up we have the amazing Charlotte, because we spoke yesterday on the, on the Women's Event for Women's Day, and Charlotte I know, she's a chemical engineer and she studied at Queen's and has a Master's, and now she works for MSD. Hello again Charlotte, how are you? Hi Neve. hi everyone, yeah really good, thank you. Yeah, how are you? Good, good. did you have a good night's sleep, because I feel like, you know, since I saw you, we were asleep. Is a good night's sleep? It's, what's yeah. the weather like? Where's it where you are? What's oh, the it's like? horrible. I'm in Kilkenny really? at the minute and it's just pouring with rain, sadly. Oh, but dear. that's Ireland oh, wow. for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But anyway, I'll come back to you shortly to hear about your career. And then we have the lovely Liam, uh, who uh, I think he studied electronic engineering at IT Carlo also. And now he works at Boston Scientific. Hi, how are you, Liam? And uh, where are you? Where are you calling from today? I'm just outside Carlo, getting washed away by the monsoon rains. Oh, so it looks like the same oh, rain in Kilkenny as yeah. in Carlo. Oh, God. All right. OK, well, let's not talk about the weather. It's too depressing. All right. I'll come back to you shortly. So so let's get let's get stuck in. And everyone, this is your event. I am the facilitator. I am a very nosy and curious person. So I have tons of questions. But honestly, if you have a question, it really is a good time to ask it. And um and then if you don't feel like you want to ask it now, um, you know, uh, Radu and, and Charlotte and Liam are more than happy to take your questions if you facilitate them through Kaylee and through CalMast and they'll get them to them as well. So, you know, I understand sometimes you just don't want to ask a question on these platforms. But if you did, it's available to you. OK, so um, Radu, let's go back to you. Uh, so you're in Transylvania, which is 
amazing uh, already. There's so many questions, but I might ask you those at the end. They're just tourist questions. Tell us about your career so far and how you have uh, managed to work at ESB International, which is, you know, a fantastic company, you know, to, to work yeah. in. So tell us, yeah, tell yeah. us, tell us about your career journey so far. So, so basically, um, I was not born in Ireland. I, I was born in Romania and I went over to Ireland in 2005. The plan was to uh, only stay over there and travel for about uh, a year and maybe save enough money to buy a motorbike when I get home, as in uh, back to Romania. And uh, yeah, that never happened. I never managed to buy a motorbike, but I never got to go home either. Uh, I stayed on and I worked on. Um, I had I was only 19 and I had just graduated, uh, I suppose, secondary school. We call it high school over here. Yeah. Um, and I worked a few years and I realized at some stage something hit me um, and I realized I wanted to go into engineering, into civil, civil engineering, because I loved that in anything to do with uh, putting up buildings. And in 2009, I uh, signed up as a mature student in IT Carlo, civil engineering course. Um, and uh, five years later, I got an honors degree. Now, because I was a mature student and the times were like that, it was a five year full time course for an honors degree. And uh, in 2014, I, I graduated uh, with honors from, from IT Carlo. Uh, it was a very good experience. Um, my, I suppose, there was a bit of a legacy from my secondary school um, in terms of STEM um, curriculum, etc., that helped me uh, uh, out. But it was a good experience as a mature student as well. I suppose I was out working away in restaurants and pubs and all that stuff, having fun for about five years, and then I decided, no, no. Uh, I want to pursue a career in, uh, in engineering. Uh, I don't know how I came to that conclusion at the exact time uh, when I came to that conclusion, but it fit me as a, as a glove, I suppose. You know? um, I think the, 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 the fact that I was interested in anything to do with buildings and how yeah. they're coming up and uh, you know, what makes them stand up and you know, watching Dublin being built up at the time uh, when I was in a, in a double, on a, in a double decker bus mm. going to work. I think that's what kind of pushed me to go towards uh, civil engineering. And I did work a bit uh, during college uh, as a surveyor. And in 2014, I graduated and I started working for IGSL, Irish Geotechnical Services. It's, yeah. um, it's, a, it's a geotech company as a, a graduate uh, geotechnical engineer. So I was going around the country. I got to see the whole country uh, doing uh, soil tests and uh, just assessing the engineering properties of, mm. uh, of soils. Uh, and that was great. It was great fun because I, I got to stay, stay away and, you know, have a bit of fun with, uh, with the lads and all that stuff. And I learned a lot about Ireland and, and about geology in, in general, mm. I suppose. Uh, and it was a very good experience for me because I was hands-on uh, on a site. Uh, but then there was an opportunity to start, um, right, to, to apply for the ESB graduate program for engineers. Uh, and I want to emphasize that this program goes on every year and it's, it, it opens every year for future graduates um, to apply for. And uh, I applied for that. Uh, I would have been two years out of college, but the program addresses to graduates that are a maximum three years out of college. So I applied for that and with my experience and my IT Carlo education, um, I got a job with, uh, with ESB as a graduate engineer in 2016. Uh, and it was really good because that really uh, bumped up and accelerated the learning I would get during the first phases of my working career. Um, yeah, and I, I, I'm still with them. I'm actually at the moment taking a, a sabbatical year, uh, you know, a year off uh, my career uh, since February. Um, but in ESB International, there were there were a lot of experiences uh, that I got to to live, and um, I suppose they helped uh, me with learning. And the company is really good uh, to 
to support the engineers and provide them with a clear career path. Yeah. Um, so yeah, for ESB, I worked as a, as a DEMS risk assessment engineer as a thermal station um, uh, maintenance engineer, I suppose, on, on their civil assets. I worked as a uh, enabling works engineer over in the UK when ESB was developing a new project. Um, I worked on uh, wind farms over in, in County Kerry as a, a site engineer, um, now civil based or civil uh, oriented. And lately, I was working as a, as a project engineer, which works closely with the project uh, manager, but coordinates the engineering, um, the engineering uh, departments, such that there is good communication between everyone involved from the very inception of a project till the project is delivered. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I suppose uh, if I were to talk to someone who's 16 at the moment or tell my 16 myself when I was 16 um, something is to make sure you start something that you like because you will never uh, work one day in, in your life and things will to start at something that you like things will keep on coming to you and there's there's uh, there's always going to be a build up of things yeah. to do yeah yeah Brilliant, Radu. That's great. Thanks for that. That's really you. You capture that really well. I've got lots of questions on that, and I'll come back to you with questions on that. But thank you so much for taking us through that. It's been a really interesting career, you know, very, very interesting. So, so thanks for sharing just a little piece of that. Brilliant. So, Charlotte, tell us, um, tell us a bit about you. You, you, you have you're you're out of college just uh, a, a short while. So, while you may not have the extensive of Radu's career, you certainly have a lot of interesting insights into how you managed to get to where you are today at MSD. So, tell us your career story so far. Yeah, so um, I studied chemical engineering with a year in industry um, at Queens. Um, so. With the year in industry, then you were actually able to get out for a year and get some industry experience and go to like a, a company and see what you would be doing kind of after you graduated. And um, so I actually did my placement with MSD as well. And then I enjoyed it so much that I came back after um, I finished my degree. Um, but I suppose how I got into chemical engineering initially so when I was in school I just didn't really know what I wanted to do and um, I knew what I enjoyed so I knew I enjoyed maths and science like chemistry and physics um, and quite often when you enjoy those subjects you're kind of pushed towards medicine but I just knew that wasn't something that I was interested in um, and I wanted to find out other opportunities that were out there for me so when I applied to my colleges at the time, I still wasn't sure. So I wanted to keep my options open. So I applied for multiple things, one of them being like pharmacy. I applied for like straight chemistry, chemical engineering. Um, and then how I really tied it down to engineering and that that's what I was interested in was I went to an open day at the college. So I went and they they showed you around the building that you would be kind of doing your lectures in. They took you through the labs and um, you were able to speak to some students that were doing the course already. Um, and that really gave me an insight into what I would be doing. And it really like persuaded me. And even going to one of those days and speaking to other people who are interested in the course as well, like I was able to find a lot of common interest with the people who were at the open day. So it kind of made me feel like this is where I would fit in and like I would really enjoy um, this subject. So I guess that's how I got into chemical engineering. And then after having done my year's placement at MSD, I just really enjoyed the work that I was doing. So I went back to MSD then and I'm currently on their graduate program. So I'm based in Tipperary and um, so at a site, um, MSD Ballydine. And um, so we kind of work 
um, to make pharmaceuticals, so active pharmaceutical ingredients, and then actually making those into tablets for patients. And yeah. mm. um, so, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. And I really like that I'm helping patients and like I'm involved in something that's so important yeah. um, without having to like directly be involved in something like medicine. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And what's a typical day like for you then, um, Charlotte? Yeah, so um, I have just rotated there at Christmas time. So yeah. as part of the graduate program, you do do a number of roles on site. So say before Christmas, my day would have been, um, I would have had meetings with operations in the morning. Then I would have been in and out of the factory floor, kind of speaking to operators, making mm. sure that um, the products were running there would be a lot of problem solving involved. So if something stopped working or um, was there was a breakdown somewhere or you weren't maybe getting the yield that you would normally expect, then you're kind of involved with working with a team of people to kind of figure out what exactly is wrong, how, how you can fix it and then how you can prevent it happening again. So yeah. that was a huge part of my job beforehand. Um, whereas now I would be involved in um, new product introduction. So any of the new products that are coming in and they want to manufacture at our site in the future, um, all the research is done in America. So you're working with a lot of um, Americans to then scale up the process to our factory and see how it'll work at our site and what best suits us in order to meet the production demand. Very good. That sounds really interesting. Great. So it's very varied, very, very varied. Yeah, very varied. And Lovely. that's what's great about the graduate programme, because you do get to see different aspects. Um, yeah. And it's great understanding the different areas yeah. that you might be working with people. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. OK, Sharon, I'll be back for more questions. Thanks for that. That's great. And then uh, Liam, tell us tell us about, about your career path so far and how you've managed to get to Boston Scientific and, and uh, all the different avenues that you've been down? Uh, I suppose like most 18 year olds at 18 I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, I knew I was good at maths and I knew I hated languages um, but come CAO time I kind of blanked on what I was supposed yeah. to do. Yeah. So I ended up taking a year out, um, finished did my leaving cert, took a year out, went to Australia, worked mm -hmm. and traveled for a year mm -hmm. um, during which time I actually was living with my uncle for a period and he was an electronics engineer um, so I spent some time actually going to work with him, kind of shouting him in the labs, that kind of thing. I realized it was something that was enjoyable. It was something I wanted to do. So came back home, applied to IT Carlo um, for electronic systems engineering. Um, went through my four years there. Um, absolutely fantastic course. Uh, really good for like the practical side of things. You're not just kind of stuck in lecture halls where someone talks to you. It's really hands on. You're doing things, you're making things. Um, then I suppose as I was graduating, the whole COVID bubble hit and jobs and that were suddenly becoming a little bit more sparse. Um, so through a lot of the staff at Carlo, I was able to make connections with Boston Scientific. And one of the projects they were working on, they were looking to basically fund uh, a research project. Yeah. So I applied for it, went through the whole process and luckily I was awarded it. So I'm currently working on my PhD partnership with Boston Scientific and the IRC. Wow. Um, and that's kind of side, it's kind of half and half PhD, half and half working as the uh, R&D engineer. Um, so it's it's fantastic. It's It keeps you busy. And I suppose that's probably the best thing about working on the R&D side of things is there is no kind of like, oh, what's your day to day? It, it's, it's different every day. Every day you come yeah, in, you're yeah. creating something that hasn't been created before. You're trying to do something that no one's done before. So yeah, the yeah. problems you encounter and it's just a case of sitting down with the team working out what's the best solution, how are we going to tackle this, and try and find ways to do things that no one's done before, I suppose. Brilliant. Um, and like, when you were 18, did you think that you were ever going to do a PhD? Oh, God, no. I, I was thinking I'd barely get my, uh, like, a level seven at the time. Amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but it's just, it, things change when you find that, when you find you're interested in something, it all just kind of fits in. And it's very true. I suppose, yeah. as I was going through it, when I got my level, by the time I got my level eight, I kind of wanted that bit more. And now that I'm working with Boston, with R&D, it's, you're not stuck. I'm not an electronics engineer. I'm, they refer to you as an R&D engineer because you do everything. I've done courses in chemistry and physics and fluidics and all that kind of stuff. And it's, it's all things that you can just add to your CV. So as you're working through your day-to-day -day job, 
your CV is getting bigger, your experience is getting bigger, and now I can move to a different field if I wanted to because I have the qualifications in it. That's brilliant. And can you give us a brief uh, summary of what your PhD is about? What What are you focusing on? Ish. I know well, it's probably complicated, but just if you can put it in everyday language or give us an analogy or something, just so we understand what you're trying to do. Yeah, I'm probably going to put a lot of people off doing a PhD with it. Um, but oh. I suppose the biggest thing is, I suppose a lot of you have iPhones at home. And yeah. when you click your little fake home button, you get that click feedback. Um, yeah. That's through a piece of technology called Piezo. And that's basically what my PhD is all around is. It's a material that when you apply force to it, it generates an electrical voltage and vice versa. So that's what my PhD is around is building these for um, implantable technologies for human body. So any kind of new medical implants that can utilize this technology and making sure it's suitable and advanced enough. That's amazing. So how far into your PhD are you now? just about to enter my third year now so i've got oh, one more year left Ooh, fun stuff so yeah i haven't done a phd i'm going Ooh, you know <laughs> for you and phds are not easy guys they're they're they are they are tough. Uh, yeah they are heavy going and the write-up and everything they're they're great so so fair play to you so let's see has anyone asked us a question no, it's okay it's fine i'm going to keep asking questions so um i'm going to go back to you um radu uh who do you think um has helped you get to where you are today you know we all have people along the way so if I, i'll talk about myself first so for me it's my dad right so in the house i grew up in i was very lucky in that he never mom or dad in fairness they really wanted us to go to college they'd never been to college and they said that they wanted to make sure that we could go to college so they um had they invested in a set of encyclopedia so encyclopedia for people who are listening it's kind of like predated google they were books and for some reason it was they always had the answer to anything that you put in i don't know how they work but anyway they did and uh that was available to me and it was never there was never any question about me being a girl like my brother and myself we both did exactly the same things and it was sort of you know they made it very real that i could be an engineer that it, that it was possible and so they were a big inspiration um for me and then there were other there were other people along the way and um, that kind of got me to where i am today so for you who do you think you know was really helped you or guided you or that you had one conversation with somebody that kind of kickstarted because you said you know ESB has been has been great as a graduate program but to get to there who who kind of helped you um I actually and I maybe it's it's totally diff, a, a totally different answer to what you're expecting right yeah yeah um, but I was working in a you know restaurant coffee shop fast food place whatever you want to call it it was everything right and um there was this guy there who was a regular um and he came in nearly every every single day with his family and we got to chatting and you know he was he was a decent guy uh and i was living in port leash at the time right um i was thinking maybe i wanted to do something i didn't know what exactly and um one day he came over to have his breakfast and uh i i i told him, oh, yeah, no, I'm going back to college, well, not back, but I'm going to college. And his response was, no, nothing malicious, but his response was, ah, you, you won't last more than a year. And I'm not sure if that motivated me in any way, but every year that passed and I was uh, passing my exams <laughs> uh, and I would see him coming over for his, for his breakfast and his meals, I'd be going, Blackie, and now his name was Blackie, right? Uh, Blackie, look, another year has passed. Uh, another year has passed. Um, I suppose when I did graduate, I did tell him, look, I'm only coming, uh, coming in to tell you that I'm after graduating. Um, I suppose you have people around you who support you. And my, my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, um, she was working during my college years. I was working part-time during college uh, because we were over in Ireland kind of by ourselves. Um, and of course, my, my family always supported me when I made a decision and I told them, look, uh, I think I'm going back to college. And they were like, great, that's exactly what you need to do. Um, my parents were not college graduates. Um, my brothers are, I have, two, I have two more brothers, older brothers, and they're college graduates. 
Um, I was not comparing to them and the fact that they've graduated college was not a um, um, motivation for myself. But I think that guy yeah. in the restaurant yeah, yeah. Um, saying, you know, he, 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 he was just being honest, I suppose. Yeah, he, just, yeah. he didn't realize what he was saying, but he said, you won't last more than a year. Um, and it maybe it got stuck behind my, you know, behind at the back of my head. And that's what pushed me. But at the end of the day, I suppose, um, I was thinking long term about the you know financial security and your your social status etc 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 they they tend to come once you make these steps they these things the other things fall into place um like i said i i remember going to ireland with a suitcase having just the suitcase um you don't want to know how many 40 foot containers uh I could fit my my belong my belongings at the moment, um, but I think that's what uh, that's what yeah. really uh, something that that triggered. Um, yeah, and you know, and sometimes like those those people can you know it's almost like um, you know it, it's it's the negative actually can motivate as much as the positive. You know that that to defy them and you know you're you're going yeah well. I'm still there. So it, it might have been, it was probably nice for you to reflect back on that. And you're kind of going, well, I must be doing something right because I'm still there or there must be something right about this. So that's really and interesting. Yeah. The truth, is, yeah, sorry for cutting across, but I just want to say one more thing. The truth is um, I didn't apply for uh, an honors degree course. Yeah. I signed up for a, for a certificate. It was a two year course and, I, you know, things moved well and I did well. And I said, I'm, I'm just gonna go, go do the diploma. It's another year, sure. It was the harm. And I did the diploma and I was thinking, sure, I did the diploma. Why not do the honors degree? Um, and that's how I got to the five years. It wasn't, uh, I didn't embark on a five year journey thinking, yes, this is clear in my head. In five years time, I'm gonna have a, uh, a degree. And um, you know, I took everything step by step. And that's why I'm saying, um, I was lucky enough to know what or to find out what the first step should be or what I'd like the first step to be. I wasn't really afla- afraid to, to try it out. Um, I think we learn, if not more equally from failures uh, compared to our successes as well. Absolutely, so, absolutely. Yeah. It's very true. Thanks, Radu. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think you learn more from failing, actually, because that's the only way you can get better at something. It's brilliant. Um, and and Lean, what about you? Who you know in your in your formative years? Like I know you said you had your you had your uncle. I mean, he's clearly um, somebody that definitely influenced you. But you, it's very interesting that you had the confidence to take the year out. You know, because that's not something a lot of us feel that we can do. You know, because when you're in school, you know, they're telling you CAO, CAO, fill out your CAO. And for you to have the confidence to decide, well, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take a year out. Who helped you, you know, make that wise choice? I suppose that comes down to my dad. Um, my dad started working when he was about 16 and he kind of been stuck in the same job for his entire life. Um, and he wasn't happy with it, basically. He always wanted to go back to college, but it was never really an option for him. Um, so when I was talking to him, I said basically that I, I don't know what I want to do. And I was concerned that I was going to get into a, a degree that wasn't going to be something I would feel fulfilled with. Yeah. And um, we talked it through and it came down to the fact that if you don't know what you're going to do yet, it's not a good idea to kind of make that decision. Because once you go to college, then it's straight to the job. Then it's you're in that kind of rat race then. Yeah. Um, so he said, look, you're, you are only 18. Um, go out and experience the world. Go out and experience something different. Um, work hands on, work a trade and just see what you like. So when I was in Australia, I was working as a warehouse operator, a welder. I was working on building roads, especially whatever job was available at the time I was taking it. Yeah. And it kind of it gave, gave you that chance to get away from the school side of things because you kind of really fit into this rut with school of you study, you memorize things and you write them down and that's that. Um, so it gave me a chance to kind of get away from that, kind of clear the mind a bit and just kind of figure out what it is that I actually wanted from my life. Um, and luckily, yeah, my uncle was around to actually give me the opportunity to see his work and just see that it wasn't something that where you're just stuck in an office in front of a computer screen day after day, yeah. rinse, repeat. Yeah. It was something where it was exciting every day. Every day you'd go in and it was something different. It was something new and it was challenge as opposed to just 
you know, just filling out the same forms. Yeah, um, brilliant. So, yeah. yeah, very smart, very smart idea. And I think I think there's loads of people who don't know what they want to do, and they do. They just do a course. I mean, I I honestly I did that. I really like I loved engineering, but I I I don't know if I was fully sure that I knew why I was doing engineering. Do you, you know what I mean? Like, because I've kind of moved into communications now, and I was clearly artistic and and logical and it was a very I found like completing the CAO form I found it really hard because there was no one course for what I wanted and in hindsight doing something like what you did would have probably it just would have kind of I mean it all worked out it all that's the thing it all works out in the end anyway but it it just it it might have been more pleasant for me you know and uh, I agree with you I think in school you know, um, the thing about school is like everything you're you're kind of guided by the hand a lot in school. And then once you leave school, it's kind of up to you. And college is very much like it's kind of up to you. So mm-hmm. to have that kind of transition and time to think when if you're not ready or if you don't know where you're going to college, I think that that was very smart advice um, off your off your dad. So fair play to him. And, and, you know, it, I can imagine like it's not the done thing so I would say you know a lot of people would kind of they would think oh he's off the rails look at him gone off yep. traveling he'll never come back and what are you doing giving him the freedom you know what I mean I can imagine a lot of people would have said that did they at the time like, yeah no yeah, that's yeah. like if I could go back and just say like the biggest piece of advice I could give to anyone kind of in that stage of life is don't panic so much about yeah. stuff there is time I mean I failed my second year of college there you go. Um, at the time, yeah. I thought that was the end of the world. But uh, if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't be in the position I am now. I wouldn't have the job I have now. It's just you got to just take it one step at a time and life finds its way to work out. It does work out. Yeah. And I think we we keep this pressure on ourselves, you know, and it's just it's all going to be OK. Thank, thanks, Liam. And, and, and Charlotte, you said that, you know, from, from what you said, you said it was it was that information day that kind of made you really think about about chemical engineering. Um, yeah. What was it about that conversation that made you go? Hmm. like what did that person say that made you start to really think actually this could be the thing that I want to do I think like it's really important to kind of go there like I feel like when you're in a place you really get a feel for something like it's not something that you can put into words but you can just sense that it's right for you Um, and even speaking to a lot of people who are there at the open day like I think when you're 15 16 sometimes you think oh some people have their lives all figured out they know that they want to go to college do this then they'll be in this job in 10 years time they'll be here Um, and you kind of think like why don't I know this Um, but speaking to other people who were at the day like they didn't know what they wanted to do either and I really found that something to like relate to they knew what they enjoyed they were there because they had an interest in maths and science and they wanted to learn more but like I could really find a common interest with them because yeah. like they didn't know what path their life was going to take and at the open day it was kind of explained that there's so many different opportunities within engineering that if you study like an engineering degree you can go into multiple different like disciplines like I have friends who are on my course that work with renewable energy now whereas that's completely different to like pharmaceuticals that I work in yeah Um, and like we're all scattered around Ireland now but like everyone's doing slightly different things and if you can try something if you don't like it and then change to something new see what suits you best yeah 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 that's it that's it but you know I think I have done these I've done these events for CalMass for a few years now and the common denominator I think from I would say 90% of the people that I speak to they all say when they were at the time when they were filling out the CEO, they really didn't know what they wanted to do. And so the majority of the people don't know what they want to be. And only some people know what they want to be. And it's great if you know at a very young age what you want to be. I mean, everything is it's it's so easy. But I think the majority was we need to figure it out because a career is is it's just something, it's it's a part of your of your being. It's it's not just this thing that you go to every day. And I think we we kind of it's part of our own self-development and, and um, I think it's great that you spoke to people that kind of took the pressure off you and made you realize oh that's okay I can breathe and I do this course but that doesn't mean I'm going to end up in it, it means I could end up doing you know when you say sustainability or, or energy or whatever in the end so, so thanks Charlotte for that and um, Liam I'll go to you then so when you were in school 
what were the subjects that you were most interested in and have those subjects been a constant thread in your career? Um, I suppose going back to like my first year in secondary school, I was put into kind of uh, bottom pass level maths because um, I just, I'd, I'd flunked the, they did like entrance exams kind of thing and I'd, I'd flunked them. Um, mm. And I suppose just as through the course of the school, I managed to work my way up to the top honours level. And that was massively due to one of the teachers there who taught applied maths as well. Um, and she just kind of saw it as a fact of if, if you want to, if, you, if you're good at maths and you flunk an exam, it's not like you're not set in stone then. There's that fluidity of it. And I suppose I always liked maths and I hated languages because of irregular verbs, past, future tense, all that stuff. It drove me mental. I love the consistency of maths. It was two plus two is four and that's that. It's always that. Um, so I knew whatever I was going to do was going to be maths orientated, whether that be accounting, engineering, there's a whole bunch of options I looked into. Um, but yeah, it just came back to that whole thing of I, I wanted something, a job that was flexible. I wanted something where yeah. it wasn't set in stone. I wanted something where I suppose it was, it's a different thing every day. Um, I didn't, I, I could see my dad and what the kind of that whole repeated thing did to him over the years. And I knew I didn't want that for myself. Yeah, um, yeah, so yeah. engineering seemed like the best kind of fit after all was yeah. taken into account. Yeah. And it's not interesting though, you know, you mentioned the thing about flunking your exam and, you know, sometimes you can be haunted by that and you think, oh, I'm not good at this because I didn't do well. And that's a great teacher that she, that she managed to turn you around and, and get you top of the class. Like she, I, I guess she must've been a big inspiration to you. So what did she do? for maths that to make you change your relationship with it what changed for you in those um, years that you worked with her actually it's, it's probably down to two teachers I had one teacher I got moved up to about second or third honors at the time and I was doing applied maths with the excellent teacher at the time as well that was one of the choices I'd taken but I was in only second honors and I had a really bad relationship with that teacher she kind of had a bit of she had it out for me basically and she yeah. wanted nothing to do with me um, and I actually signed the forms to be dropped down to the next class lower because I just wanted to be out of her class because um, it became that way. And luckily, the top honors teacher came down and spoke to her and said, uh, you're not dropping him. He's coming to my class. So she stepped in, just took me into the top honors class at that stage. And it completely changed my relationship with maths then because it stopped being a class I dreaded because of the teacher that was teaching it. It started being a class I'd look forward to because suddenly I had a teacher that was interested in the subject, someone that was, they, they taught it in a way that wasn't a chore. They taught it in a way that you could tell they loved maths themselves. Um, so it, it, it completely changed me. Um, and I had her for the last two years of my, of my secondary school level. Um, and it, it completely changed my view on maths entirely. And it became a subject I really, really enjoyed. Isn't that amazing? Do you know what I mean? If you hadn't met her you would always think, oh, I'm rubbish at maths. And now look yeah. at you doing a PhD on, on uh, P Piso, Piso? Yeah, Piso, Piso yeah. yeah. Yeah, unbelievable. Thanks, Liam, that's great. Um, what about you then, Red, Redu? What about when you were in, in, in secondary school? Or what kind of education system was there actually, firstly, explain that. And then what were the subjects, like is there a thread for you in your life with, with certain subjects? Absolutely, yeah, and um, it's interesting. Back in, in Romania, uh, there are three uh, tiers of education, primary, yeah. middle, and um, I suppose uh, high school. And high schools have a set curriculum. You could have STEM curriculum or you could have languages curriculum. And it was funny to, to hear Liam, how he hated languages when I, the first two years of my last four in education were in a language in a languages curriculum and I was learning you know latin verbs and you know past tenses and all that sort of crack uh, and I learned english as well you know <laughs> uh, but after the two years I moved on to uh, to a stem maths and information technology it was called you know uh, a computer science curriculum and uh, that kind of helped me realize that yeah maths is not too bad uh, I, I could do it if I if I started with the first step and I, I went on uh, building up on that I could do maths and I could do uh, anything really that the teachers would um, throw at me I particularly liked um, organic chemistry if you can believe that you know uh, we were talking we were talking about carbons and hydrogens and all that and I really liked that and I helped a lot of my colleagues actually pass the classes. But anyway, that's a different story. Yeah. Uh, 
And then in when I, I I took five years off education when I was in Ireland and, and having fun and doing a bit of work um, outside uh, of the education system. And I went back to IT Carlo to start the engineering course. Yeah. And I knew, look, at I, I was a bit, well, I didn't know, but I was a bit wary of my uh, capability to, to actually sit down and do, do the work. And again, it's a case of just sitting down and doing it step by step there is a bit of work involved in being successful. Success is not something that you're born with or you're lucky. You have to put in a bit of work. Um, and no matter what you do, be it that you like it or you don't, you still have to put in the work yeah. in order to be successful. So uh, I knew I was coming from a background you know, in, in catering, so to speak. Um, and my motivation was to actually, you know, build up a, a CV to allow me to, 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 which will allow me entry in the industry in Ireland yeah. uh, post-graduation. Um, and uh, uh, I was involved in the engineering society and I was involved in um, other uh, volunteering. Uh, IT Carlo actually awarded me um, student of the year, one of the years, um, not that I wanted to be student of the year, but uh, I found that to be a very good motivator for my for the lads in my class as well. But um, I suppose the idea is um, that I wasn't always aware of my capabilities in maths or languages and, and so on. But I sat down and did a bit of work and then it kind of everything fell into place, you know, uh, and uh, that's what I found even now and I'm doing varied work at the moment and even post graduation there's been a learning process there's been a lot of learning involved in in, in my career um, and if you tell someone what you are at the moment you, you can scare them away yeah uh, because you you can't paint an exact picture of how you've gotten there but yeah. the idea is that you've gotten there step by step and um, if you take each step and you put in a bit of work to put your leg in front of it, uh, you're, you're successful at the end of the, at the, end of the yeah. day. Yeah, you know? I agree. And, you know, I, I love what you're saying about like the whole failing and all that kind of stuff. Like you only get good at something if you give it focused attention. You know, like I think anybody can be good at any subject. I really do. But I think it's like what Liam said. Sometimes it's just down to your relationship with that teacher that could just make you think you don't you can't do it. And sometimes it's just that you're not putting like I, I when I was in school, I always um, I never asked why enough, you know, and my my confidence, if I'm really honest, my confidence around maths and physics and stuff actually came when with the dawn of YouTube, I realized only recently that I'm a visual learner. I'm not a, I'm not a reader, you know, and I, you know, I, I do read books, but I'm, I'm not really, I'm more, I'm way more of a visual person. And so when I was like, you know, getting up and kind of trying to explain like, you know, basic physical subject, physics to people, I would read it and I go, ah. but then I could see a video and I go, ah, you know, and so if you don't understand something, it's not because it's not your fault. It's that you haven't found the right device or person to explain that concept to you. And then it's about you deciding, I'm going to focus my attention on getting better at that one subject. And you can decide what that subject is because you can't do it for everything. You can only do it for some. So it's interesting that you brought it up and it's come up with Liam as well, that I think it's really important for people listening today to know that just because you're struggling in maths does not mean that you can't do maths. It's that you have to find the device or the platform or the person that's going to unlock whatever the the miscommunication is for you. Would you agree, Radu? Absolutely. And if if I I was just I wanted to add that um, when I was uh, in middle school in my first year in middle school, so that's the fifth sort of educational year in in Ireland. I had a physics teacher. You know, they were mm. teaching us physics when I was like eleven or whatever. I don't know. Which is awesome. Uh, Mm. Uh, yes, yes and no, because anyway, I don't okay. want to get into that. But the idea <laughs> okay. is that guy, that teacher, and I love him for that, uh, his first lecture or his, his first class, he, he made us all write on the first page of our workbooks and notebooks in class, the, the following mo motto, you don't like 
what you don't know. So that's kind of, that's, I have applied that every time I came to a conclusion that I wouldn't like something. Um, and most of uh, the times it was because I hadn't known enough about that particular topic to actually get to enjoy it and like it. I agree. Yeah, I, I had a thing about history in school. I thought like, oh, I hate history. And actually, you know, that was just a really stupid thing to do. It was just, I, I'm just not a reader. And I just really didn't like reading facts. I needed the stories. And now I love history, you know, so I, I agree with you. Couldn't agree with you more. Um, and what about you then, Charlotte? What is the, what are the subjects that, that kind of held you that have been, you know, their constant strand for you or, or not? Um, in school and how yes. that transferred so um, I studied in Northern Ireland so it's slightly different so you have yeah. to pick your A-level subjects yeah. um, very early so you're kind of really narrowing down which path you're going to at a young age um, so I was kind of very split at the time and mm. um, I really enjoyed maths and chemistry and physics but I also really loved French and Spanish so I was like torn between two paths I was like do I go down the languages route or do I go down like the maths and science yeah, route yeah, yeah. so it was actually um my physics teacher um I had a conversation with her and she kind of was the one that kind of convinced me to go like maths physics and chemistry um and I was able to keep one of the languages on then so that was kind of a good break from the the maths and science I was able to split some of my time and like kind of an escape because it was something that I enjoyed but I wasn't necessarily going to focus my career yeah. on it um but one thing I would say as well is like if you know that you enjoy something try not to let like a teacher put you off it because um so I I had picked my um a level subject so that would be like the leaving cert and at what equivalent of junior cert I loved chemistry I had an yeah. amazing chemistry teacher he was so practical doing experiments with us all the time and then I had to take uh, some time off school because I had um, an operation just at the start um, of when our all of our classes changed and in the lead up to our A levels and when I came back, um, the teacher had kind of decided that I was a lost cause because I'd been off school and was really trying, I don't know, to put me off doing chemistry. And like, I was just so determined then. I think he even made me more determined because I was like, no, I enjoy this and I can do it. So I just really like spent a lot of time, like, as you said, like I put my focus into that and I was like, no, I can do this. I'm going to show him that I can do it and that I really enjoy it. So I would just say, please, like, don't let someone yeah. else or a teacher or your friends even put you off doing something so that you true. enjoy. Yeah, it's so true, Charlotte. It's so true. It's so true. Um, we do have a question, and I think it's it's something that um, some of the students are very interested in. I'm conscious that we have five minutes left. So just quickly, um, see you, Mr. McSharry. So he has to leave, but he enjoyed the show, or he enjoyed it very much. Some of the students would love to hear about salaries. So would anyone like to take that and just give us a little bit of an idea about salaries? I can go first. Yeah, uh, well. thanks, Liam. In the medical field, you can expect the starting salary to be in the range of thirty to forty thousand, um, and then I suppose it's kind of taken on the basis of how how well you're doing, how much work you're putting in, how the company values you. Um, but I know a lot of my colleagues are earning sixty thousand and upwards mm. after mm. less than ten years of working. Mm. Yeah, I think Jerry is a good profession in that way financially. Radu or Charlotte, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, mine would be um, like similar um, yeah. to Liam. So your starting salary, you could kind of expect 30 to 40,000 just depending on what yeah. company. But there's yeah. lots of room like to grow there. Yeah. And diff like as with most jobs, there's different grades. So you can get promoted up and your salary will grow um, kind of as you get more experience. Yeah, we do the same. Uh, same kind of numbers. Same here, yeah. Mid yeah. thirty thousand yeah. for the uh, ESB graduate program when when you get enrolled in that. But um, uh, I suppose the industry in general is very um, employee oriented at the moment uh, for for um, construction and engineering, and 
you could get to a to you know to a six figure uh, song fairly quickly. Uh, you know that's in a, in excess of a hundred k um, salary, depending on on your field of expertise. But um, yeah, the starting salaries um, range. Yeah. Okay. So three minutes. So one minute each. I want you to um, give your top advice to the the students listening today in terms of uh, what would you what would you advise them uh, going forward? Anything at all? Any any little last kind of nuggets? You've got kind of one minute one minute each. So Charlotte, I'll start with you. Yeah, I would say um, don't be afraid if you don't know what you want to do. Um, the best thing to do is kind of get out there, speak to people who are in the jobs and um, try and understand what they would do. And if that's something that you're interested in and even try and get like some experience somewhere, because that will really tell you um, if that's something that you would like to pursue. Um, and don't necessarily follow what your friends are doing. So if your friends are all going to one university, studying one, um, one degree or one kind of area, don't feel like you need to do that as well. Um, like you'll make new friends in, at college, you'll make new friends in the jobs, but you'll still be able to keep in contact and kind of share your experience with the friends you made at school. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Thanks, Charlotte. Yeah, very good. I would agree completely with what you said there. Liam, what would you give us your one minute nugget? Um, don't panic over the little things. Um, I, I spent my whole life panicking over absolutely everything that happened. And if it, if it hadn't happened, I wouldn't be where I am now. you got to just take the hits as they come, move on from it and just keep going. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Liam. And then Radu, what would you yeah, advise? Uh, I suppose don't be afraid to do what you like if it's contrary to what the, the, the collective is doing or your parents or, you know, once once you've gotten onto a road that you like you you will uh the reward will follow and um, that's no doubt about that yeah yeah brilliant and i would say the same i'd say stop don't follow the crowd um you know if if you want to study physics where is the best place in the world to study physics uh, with engineering and who is the absolute best engineer uh, that you know and what college is that in don't confine yourself to ireland don't confine yourself to europe go where the person that 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 inspires you like go big and then you can always then have a smaller scale of, of what you want like don't limit yourself to what you think you're capable of doing because that's what i did and don't, and don't make that mistake you know you are you are the um, you set the tone in terms of the boundaries that you decide and um, to live your life. So don't let anyone do that. So brilliant. Thank you so much. That was a really great discussion. And I think we could keep going on and on and on. But but again, thank you, Charlotte. And a second time round again. Thank you. And thank you, Lee. Best of luck with the PhD and uh, Radu. Enjoy the sabbatical. And thank you so much for coming for us today from from Romania. And I will hand it back to Katie.